So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tanmay Bakshi and today we're going to be talking about the world of WebAssembly. Now WebAssembly kind of fundamentally changes what you are capable of doing within web browsers and through your web applications. And so to really dig into WebAssembly, I think it's first important to talk a bit more about the web to begin with. And even before I start off with that, I do want to start off uh, by saying that if you do enjoy this kind of content and you want to see more of it, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel as it really does help a lot and of course do make sure to like the video so I know you enjoy this kind of video and of course if you have any questions about what I talk about any suggestions from you on what to cover any feedback please do leave that down in the comment section below or reach out to me and I'd love to go ahead and get in touch and answer your questions now digging deeper into the world of web starting off um, personally you may know that I do not particularly enjoy web development and the reason for that um, is the abstraction Right? When you code a native application, for example, you get to know what hardware you're working with, and you get to build code to work very well on a specific piece of hardware. Uh, for example, you may know that apps like Discord and Slack aren't necessarily the most lightweight, fast, and responsive applications. Sure, they're good, and in the vast majority of cases, they work, but they're by no means an excellent user experience. And that's because these applications are powered by what's known as Electron. Electron enables you to run JavaScript code, effectively you're running a web application, you're running a web browser as a standalone application that is only running, for example, Discord or Slack. Now, the issue with this kind of application is that you are using the web dev stack. And this stack is meant to abstract away as many hardware details and computer level details as possible to make it as easy for you as a developer um, as, as it can be made easy uh, to build applications that will work cross-platform. And that goal is definitely noble, right? It makes sense that developers would want to write code once and then run it everywhere. But the unfortunate truth is that different computers different platforms require different code for a great user experience. Um, and that makes it so you can't really do really processor intensive tasks on these kinds of applications. You kind of need to do things um, that are, well, uh, that you can do abstracted away on a fast enough computer. So, for example, if you wanted to do some really intense like signal processing or, or image processing or things like this, you would need to start calling into native libraries, uh, which is a huge pain to do in these sorts of languages. Um, and the web in general, again, is built to work across devices. doesn't matter if you're using a 32-bit ARM CPU, a RISC-V, um, a PowerPC, IBM Z, or x86, right? It works across everything as long as you've got a web browser that implements, you know, the JavaScript, HTML, CSS engines that are necessary. Uh, and so this can be a challenge for developers to work with. Uh, and effectively, what WebAssembly enables us to do um, is it allows us to say, all right, let's just say we've got some native code or some low-level code, say, like in C. Um, what we can do now is we can compile that C to WebAssembly instead of having to compile it to, say, an x86 or a PowerPC or an ARM assembly. And now that it's in WebAssembly format, it's super low level. We can optimize, we can compress this code, we can make it super small. And then what we can do is when a browser wants to load up a page, obviously we're going to be sending over HTML as we usually do. But now, alongside a little bit of JavaScript code, we're also going to send over this WASM, this WebAssembly binary. And this WebAssembly binary is by the browser on the platform going to be compiled ahead of time on the fly as it's downloaded to that machine's native code and then run on the machine as well. Now, there are some limitations to this kind of approach and there's some amazing advantages. For example, as you can probably tell, one huge advantage would be throughput. There might be a little bit of latency into calling a WebAssembly function because, of course, you need to exit your JavaScript context and go into this new sort of WebAssembly context. Uh, however, that, that latency uh, can effectively be you know, nullified in a lot of cases if the amount of throughput that you get from these native functions can be great enough to, again, uh, sort of hide that latency. 
Uh, so once again, going back to the example of image processing or signal processing, if you want to do something like facial recognition uh, or running a deep neural network, uh, or you want to do some kind of like fast Fourier transform, things like this, it's usually better to do these kinds of things with native code. Again, very much depends on your use case. That's just how it usually ends up being a better user experience. Um, and so that's what WebAssembly is all about. And I've gone ahead and prepared a relatively simple demo to show off uh, what WebAssembly is capable of and why you would want to use it or not use it. Let's get deeper into that. Uh, now, of course, web uh, development is, is, is personally not something that I find exciting at all, right? It's, it's kind of hard to build code that works, but also works across lots of devices, which is what the web is built for. Um, but I've gone ahead and taken a bit of a stab at it using some open source code as well as code that I've put together um, to run this benchmark. Uh, in particular, the benchmark that we're going to be running is uh, actually a piece of custom code that I put together. Uh, some time ago, I was working on an implementation of the segmented Siva Veritostenes, um, and I took the regular Siva Veritostenes part of that and put together some code. Uh, effectively, if you, if you take a look at what I've written here. Uh, what this code will do uh, is it will take some number n, it'll find all the prime numbers up until n, and then it will sum all of those prime numbers uh, into a single number over here. Uh, and so you can see that right there. Uh, now, once it goes ahead and gets the sum of all those prime numbers, it'll just return it. Uh, by default, in my main function, I'm calculating the sum for uh, all the prime numbers up until 50 million. Uh, but just to make this a little bit more of an achievable demo for now, and I'll talk about why, I'm going to bring this down to 30 million. Uh, so, so effectively, what's happening here is I'm just printing out um, here as well how many seconds it took for this benchmark to run. All right, so that is the task that we're running. Uh, Siva Veritostenes finding all the prime numbers up until n and summing them all up into a single number. Now, uh, the keen-eyed programmers watching this video may have realized that I'm doing a bit of a no-no in this C code. Uh, I, or C++ code technically, but I'm not really using any C++ features. Um, so this over here, what is this? Why am I returning a double if I'm clearly only ever using integers? Well, it is because this exact same code that you see on screen right now, using bit arrays in the naive C function, using all kinds of pretty you know, complex features, this exact same code is going to be compiled to WebAssembly to run in the browser. And I'm also going to compile it to run locally on my machine on an Apple Silicon M1. Uh, now, the thing is, JavaScript is JavaScript, and that's unfortunate because JavaScript, for example, doesn't have support for 64-bit integers, because why would it? Uh, instead, what we have to do is we have to use doubles. Doubles, of course, being 64-bit floating point numbers, have a greater range than regular floats, and also than 32-bit integers. So while we will never be storing decimals here, I do need to use doubles, so just keep in mind, even though you are using WebAssembly here, if you're going to be interoperating with JavaScript, if you're going to be, you know, sending data back to JavaScript for it to work with, there's still going to be some limitations to what you can and cannot do. That is just the unfortunate truth of how um, web development works today. However, apart from that, this is regular C code, right? What I really want to stress here is that this isn't special C code, right? Like I, I, didn't, I didn't sit here writing, you know, special wrappers around these functions for JavaScript or anything. These are just being compiled as it is direct to WebAssembly. And I'll get to actually showing off the performance of this in just a minute. Uh, first though, I want to show you the native performance of this code. So if I go ahead and just save this, and if I were to run a very standard compile telling Clang to compile with O3 optimization, uh, then if I go ahead and run, as you can see, in about 135 milliseconds, we're able to get our valid uh, prime sum result. And just like that, we got our result. So 135 milliseconds for 30 million being the value of n. Now, before we test WebAssembly, let's go ahead and test out what happens with just plain JavaScript code. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is switch over to this other tab here. And over here, 
Now I've written a simple index.html. I got this bit array implementation from a stack overflow post that I will link in the description of this video. Uh, and then I'm using these bit arrays and also pretty much just a line for line translation of my C code into JavaScript um, in order to implement the actual Siva Veritolosthenes. Uh, so if I just go ahead and take a look at this, it's, it's practically the exact same code. Um, and then of course I can go ahead and benchmark the exact same task where n is equal to 30 million. So let's go ahead and take a look at the number of milliseconds it takes for a JavaScript implementation. Uh, then we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, what, it, what, it, what it looks like for uh, what, it, what it looks like for WebAssembly. So I'm going to go ahead and serve this HTML uh, using a very simple uh, Python command. So simply do this. And just like that, we have now exposed port 8001 uh, to, uh, to, to, to now run our benchmark on. So what I'm going to do is open up a new Google Chrome tab. Uh, I'm going to go to localhost 8001. Um, and I'm going to show you what happens as we, uh, as we go over to that web page. So I'm going to put, move this over to this window here and watch this. If I go ahead and run, just like that, our website tells us here's the result for the mathematical operation that we tried to run and it took 862.5 milliseconds to run it. Now the timing may not be exact. Every time you run it, it's going to be slightly different, but if you take a look at the result, it is the exact same from JavaScript to our C++ code right over here. So the result is correct, at least consistent between both browsers or both, both invocations. Uh, the C++ code natively took 135 milliseconds versus 862 for JavaScript. Again, every time you rerun it, it'll be slightly off, but it's in that range of like 750 to 850 milliseconds. All right, now let's take a look at what happens when we run the same thing, but through WebAssembly instead. So what I'm going to do is I've already put together a simple compile script over here. What this compile script does is it uses an application called mscripten. mscripten basically takes C and C++ code um, and it compiles it to WebAssembly. And it does so using Clang and LLVM and a bunch of its own custom libraries. Because if you think about it, if I open up my C file over here, we're including a bunch of things like standard IO, standard library, time, math, and these things don't exist just in WebAssembly, right? This is the C standard library, not the C language that we're talking about. So what mscripten does is it basically creates this sort of virtual standard library that browsers can then use um, in order to allow this code to run in the first place. Uh, and in this case, all I'm doing is I'm passing it, you know, pretty simple parameters. I'm saying I want to compile sieve.cpp. I want to export the sieve sum function, uh, starting with an underscore because that's how sieve modifies the um, symbol names. Um, and then I'm also just saying that from mscripten, I also want to export c call and c wrap, which will enable me to actually call the c function uh, from my JavaScript code. And then I'm telling it that I want to compile to WASM, WebAssembly. I want it to output to cwasm.javascript, and I want it to use the third level of optimization, which is the highest that you can use in mscripten. All right. So now if I go ahead and run this compile script, as you can see, it just complains about us not using main, but that's for our native code anyway, so that doesn't matter. As you can see, we now have cwasm.js and cwasm.wasm. The .wasm file is the actual binary file. This will not execute on your CPU. This is this is WebAssembly code. As a matter of fact, the file command doesn't even recognize what kind of binary this is. Uh, this is just raw WebAssembly code compiled to bit code. Uh, now what I can do is take a look at our new JavaScript code, which is way shorter because we're doing basically nothing in here except for invoking the WebAssembly. So what I do is quite simply load in that JavaScript file that mscripten made for us. Uh, and then I go ahead and say that whenever that module uh, is initialized, so once we initialize the whole sort of WebAssembly context that we've, um, that we've tried to create here, uh, then take the sieve sum function, call it on third n equals 30 million, uh, time the number of milliseconds, and of course print that out to the screen. So let's go ahead and take a look at what our performance looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and run that same Python command over here, this time port 8000. Um, and if I go ahead and just run this, as you can see, 
Would you look at that? Same result, but this took only 137 milliseconds. That is effectively the same amount of time it took for the actual native code to run on this machine. That is the kind of performance boost that I'm talking about you can get with WebAssembly. Now, of course, it's not always going to be this great. In fact, I'm pretty sure, although not certain, that if we were to reduce n to a small enough value, it would be faster to do it in JavaScript than it would be to do in C because of the overhead of calling the C function. That's what I mean by latency versus throughput. In this case, the throughput was enough to hide the latency of the function call. However, in a lot of cases, that might not necessarily be true. So, for example, if I were to go into index.html, uh, if I were to reduce this to, like, say, just 5 million, which is nothing, uh, for modern computers at least. Um, so if I just reduce this to 5 million both sides, uh, and if I were to run these again, it looks like they're running, uh, then if I were to refresh our JavaScript code over here, we got a different result, of course, just 153 milliseconds, versus our C code, okay, our C code is still faster. <laughs> but then again, this is a computationally intensive task. You know, I could keep going in terms of reducing the actual number that we're trying to calculate for. Uh, so let's actually try to do that. Let's see at what point, if any, WebAssembly starts to become slower. So if I were to do 1 million, for example, all right, so we're doing 1 million now. Uh, so JavaScript, 28 milliseconds. Native code, 4 milliseconds. So as you can see, the latency is very, very minimal. WebAssembly is relatively a lot more you know, planned out and actually implemented well than it was a couple of years ago, right? Latency is very, very low. But again, if you're making tons and tons of function calls to WebAssembly, where each individual call doesn't do as much work, but there are lots of calls to make, that's when you have to start to think maybe it's actually just worth using JavaScript instead. Um, again, though, every use case calls for its own sort of analysis of which language, which toolkit, which architecture makes the most sense. In this case, it just so happens that WebAssembly is way faster. <laughs> all right, so thank you very much for joining this tutorial. I do hope you enjoyed, again, all the resources that I used, uh, including the code and other tutorials, will be down in the description below if you want to get started with WebAssembly. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comment section below. I'd love to go ahead and answer them. And once again, if you do enjoy this kind of content, please do make sure to, to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. It really does help out a lot, and you'll be notified whenever I release new videos. So once again, thank you for joining today. Really do hope you enjoyed and goodbye.